episode two of Homestead Help. For this uh, month's episode, we are labeling it Tomato Talk, and we want to talk to you guys about all the different things regarding tomatoes. Now, in our little Homestead Help group here is Pepper Bradford, and we've kind of regarded him as our resident expert uh, extraordinaire on all things tomatoes, and so uh, just to open things up, we're going to turn the floor over to him and let him talk to us a little bit about them. Go ahead, Pepper. Thank you, Jared. Uh, welcome to you and Margie, and thanks for uh, having me here. I missed last time around for bandwidth issues. I'm sure we can all wait for that. Let me give you a little uh, update on my situation. I have a uh, what most people refer to as a greenhouse, but in actuality, it's a high tunnel. The uh, difference between the two of them is whether or not you have heat um, that you apply from the outside or not. Uh, for the last three or four years, I have been growing tomatoes in there for sale in my um, my local area. I just I don't, I don't go to the farmers market primarily because uh, I have a full time job during the week and Saturday's my only day to get work done. I can't spend the day at a farmers market, but um, I'll plant my tomatoes in my greenhouse. I, I'm going to refer to it as a greenhouse, even though again it's not a greenhouse. Uh, I'll start them in there. Well, last year, year before last, I actually planted them on, um, on Thanksgiving day and I had blooms uh, January the 1st and then I had my first tomatoes coming off the vine uh, in the, the end of March. Now since then I have tried my best to find some more cold tolerant tomatoes. I realize that when I say cold here in Mississippi it's a whole different level of cold than what most people are. There's a, there's a great guy and I would recommend everyone go look at his website or his uh, YouTube channel, MHP Gardener and he's up in Virginia. Now he has a whole different level of cold up there, but he has also some, some high tunnels and some greenhouses. But um, there are two main varieties of tomatoes, and it, you need to like, grab the distinction between them. The old tomatoes would call them bush tomatoes or vine tomatoes. Uh, scientifically speaking, they're called determinate or indeterminate. Now, the difference there between is when the tomato plant is growing, um, the, the, the little tiny leaves that you see, I gesture a lot, but only can see my hands gestures, the little tiny leaves you see at the top. So it's called the terminal. On a determinate plant, when that plant gets to a certain height, it has a terminal bud at the top, and then it stops growing. And it blooms from bottom to top. Once those tomatoes are set and then ripen, that plant's done. So the life of a, of a determinate bush tomato, the ones that you put inside the cage, not the ones that you put up on the string, those are bush tomatoes, determinate tomatoes, those will fruit over about a six to eight week period. And those are what people like me who like to sell to uh, market gardeners, what we call them. We like those because we can get a whole bunch coming off all at one time. The downside to that is when it's done, it's done. You rip it out, and then you got to wait another you know, 70 days for whatever goes in its spot to start blooming again. The other side of that, the tomatoes that people get from Home Depot and whatnot, your Better Boy and Best Boy and Marianne and all of those varieties that we've heard about all of our lives, um, at least in this neck of the woods, heard about all of our lives. Those are vine tomatoes. Those are going to continue to grow until the cold kills them all, or until they die of disease. Um, when you go into a greenhouse, a full greenhouse tomato operation, you'll see tomato plants that are 30, 40 feet long that are 8, 10, 12 months old. Now, for those varieties, what it is, they will bloom, and they will put on tomatoes one or two a week. Uh, the determinants they'll put on 20 or 30 tomatoes a week per plant. Now, it's interesting. Both plants... Um, scientifically speaking, I, I've done a lot of research, a lot of education I've gotten from the uh, Mississippi Extension Service. They put out a lot of good material. Matter of fact, Mississippi has a uh, world-renowned greenhouse tomato short course. The people come from all over the country and all over the world to come to this one because for whatever reason, Mississippi has, and Louisiana to a certain extent, have really focused on tomatoes. But um, anyway, one tomato plant, on average, is going to give you about 25 pounds of tomatoes over the course of its life. Now, the ones I plant, the determinate variety, the bush variety, they'll give you that 25 pounds in about six weeks. If you plant Better Boy or Big Boy or one of your heirlooms, they're going to give you that 25 pounds over the course of six to seven months. So how much tomato you get depends on what you plant, and that decision is how you want it to have your tomatoes come off. For me, I want a lot of tomatoes because I'm going to have, you know, I want to sell three, 400 pounds of tomatoes a weekend. Um, if you're a home gardener, 300 pounds of tomatoes per weekend might be problematic. Let's let's call it problematic. Um, well, even with mine, you know, I don't always sell out, and so I am left to try to figure out ways to. What do I do with my extra tomatoes now? Um, 
for me, and I know we, there's more to growing than what I talked about, but you know, I'll get my three or four hundred pounds of tomatoes um, and sell, and I'll sell probably half of it. So what I do with the rest of it? Um, all manner of different ways to try to get rid of them. I have become very popular at church when I'm on Sunday mornings when I take what I didn't sell on Saturday to church on Sunday mornings. Some of the little old ladies who you wouldn't think would scratch and fight over tomatoes, in fact, will scratch and fight over free tomatoes. But um, one of the we we make uh, every Tuesday night in my household is a spaghetti night. We make uh, we take the tomatoes, put them in the crock pot for eight hours with some with some garlic and onions, and we make tomato sauce on a regular basis, and we will freeze it in the mason jars. We haven't had one. You know, it occurs to me that freezing a, a liquid in a mason jar is probably not the best thing to do because the liquids expand, glass explode. But we haven't had it happen yet. Uh, I guess you give it enough headspace, and Marty makes it pick it up better than I can, and it won't. Um, I had experimented with tomato jam. It's not as disgusting as you would think, given the name. Um, it was very odd. Uh, it was tomatoes and nutmeg and lots and lots of sugar. Um, I'll try it again with a different recipe. One of the best things we have come up other than like salsa, tomato pie. Now you would think, boy, no, tomato pie. The recipe we found is tomatoes and cheddar cheese and onions and uh, some Italian seasonings. Put it in a pie crust. Put uh, puff pastry over the top. It is the world, unless you're my boys who can't stand tomatoes, it's just the best thing in the world to eat. So that's one of our favorite things to do with leftover tomatoes. But uh, as far as growing tomatoes in Mississippi, uh, or really anywhere in the zone 7 or 8, typically speaking, growing outdoors, you're not going to have tomatoes um, until coming off the vine until the end of May. Most people say you're doing good if you can have tomatoes for 4th of July. Um, I grow mine under the under the, the, the tunnel. I heat them out a little bit, but um, tomatoes need, in order to ripen, we'll get into a discussion about ripe tomatoes and green tomatoes, the store-bought tomatoes a little later. In order to ripen, a tomato needs a certain amount of sunlight. So I found uh, last year I had tomatoes that bloomed and they grew, and I had green tomatoes, golf ball to, to uh, baseball-sized tomatoes, First of January, they didn't turn right. They didn't turn red till March because they're sitting there waiting on 10 hours of sunlight a day. And until you get 10 hours of sunlight a day, that tomato's just not going to turn red. Um, so you, my greenhouse is used to keep my tomato plants alive until such time as the sunlight gets to the certain number of hours a day. Now, if you because a frost will kill a tomato, I I record the temperatures in my greenhouse, and once it gets to 30, it, they'll survive a night of 30. They'll survive. A couple of nights at that, uh, maybe even 25, but that's just air temperature. You get a frost on them with that temperature, they're, they're done. They, they, they just turn to mush. So the benefits of my setup is I keep the plant alive until such time as the sun catches up to, to its needs. If I was putting it outdoors, um, by the time it's free from frost, you know, it's been 10 hours a day for two or three months. So I get a jump start on what I do. And you can anybody can do that. All you have to do is protect them from the frost. You know. There's evidence that shows that certain nighttime temperatures will change the, the taste of a tomato. For me, uh, a homegrown tomato, any homegrown tomato in March is better than any store-bought tomato. So regardless of if the flavor's been changed, I don't care. A tomato's a tomato. My wife and I last year had our first tomato on March the 1st. It was this big. No, it was that big. And we, we cut tiny little pieces and we're like, no, no, that's mine, that's mine, no, that's mine, that's mine. You know, it was, so we were, we were rationing this one little tiny tomato. But... Uh, I found some some more cold tolerant tomatoes um, out there that will that will set fruit. And, and typically speaking, the smaller the tomato that you're growing, the actual fruit, faster it will ripen. Cherry tomatoes I have found will actually grow and ripen in the wintertime because they're yay big and it doesn't take a whole lot of sunlight to ripen them. But uh, that's what I'm known for in my area. I love to fill my greenhouse with more than just tomatoes. Um, you know, I would love to plant a whole bunch more vegetables, but I'm faced with the, the option of do I take do I take this valuable real estate and plant tomatoes, which I know and love and people know me for, and put something there that I don't know how to grow, or do I just keep on growing tomatoes? So in my neck of the woods, uh, I'm known as a tomato guy. Back to you, Jared. <laughs> okay. Now, look, I tried to follow all of that, <laughs> but I'll be honest with you. I got okay. lost a couple of times. And uh, one thing that Only a couple, you mentioned. Man, I wasn't doing my job. Yeah, there you go. Um, one thing. You were talking about uh, determinant and indeterminate, and yeah, 
I kind of took two things away from that. Indeterminate is the vining variety, meaning it's mm -hmm. indeterminate just how tall it might get. Is that a good way of looking at right. it? Right. It'll, it'll, it will keep growing until weather kills it. But also at the same time, it's indeterminate exactly when you're going to get a harvest, whereas with the bush variety, you were saying you'll get all of your tomatoes harvested in, in a short time frame. Right. With the indeterminate plant, it will continue a harvest for a while. It continues to, to set blooms um, throughout the course of its life, and uh, but it just does it at a much slower rate. You know, like I said, Mississippi State has found that no matter what the tomato plant is, generally speaking, I'm sure there's varieties out there that are that will disprove this, but most tomatoes will produce 25 pounds of fruit during the course of their life. The only question is, how long does it take them to produce that 25 pounds? The bush varieties will produce the whole kit and caboodle. In six weeks, the vine types will produce the whole thing in six months. Okay. So for, for a backyard grower, you probably want the, the vine types, which is why Better Boy uh, and Big Boy are so popular. Number one, they are, you know, those are the ones you get from Home Depot. Or Lowe's. Uh, they are also have been bred to be uh, resistant to the, the three or four main diseases. And you look at it, and it'll say Better Boy, uh, BFSW, uh, Verticillium wilt. Um, Eucerium wilt. There's several varieties out there that'll just kill a plant. They have been bred to be resistant to those, but they're hardy. They put out a good tasting tomato, and for your average farmer, uh, your average backyard grower, they're going to put out three or four tomatoes a week, as opposed to 20 tomatoes a week. You know, unless you have a giant family, who's going to want 20 tomatoes a week? So that's why the vine type tomatoes are so popular with the backyard grower because they give them exactly what they want: a few tomatoes on the weekend. And they're good for until next week. Okay. Now we do have uh, a couple followers here. Uh, share this with you guys. I want you to know that we do overrank the uh, mucking of a chicken coop. So apparently we're not at the bottom of the food chain. So that's good <laughs> to know. <laughs> but more importantly, uh, more importantly, same user here has a question uh, for you, Pepper. Uh, would an enclosed or screened porch be enough to protect tomatoes from frost, or do they need to be in a greenhouse? Well, anything. Well, all you're trying to do from a from a um, frost protection is keep the the air around the tomato from crystallizing and forming on the on the leaves of the plant. Uh, now, my greenhouse is actually large enough that um, the um, the it's got enough air inside of it that it actually will form frost inside the greenhouse unless I add some extra heat. So all you're trying to do is keep that plant, or keep the air around the plant, I should say, at 33 degrees. So put it on the screen porch. If your screen porch doesn't get to but 33 degrees on that particular night, uh, then, then you're fine. All you're, well, again, all you're trying to do is keep the frost from forming. Um, you can go out there. You can keep, um, if you spray them at night, I don't know if anybody's ever seen on the news where there's a frost coming through in the orange groves of Florida, the strawberry fields of California, and they got their... Their, their sprinklers going nonstop. If you hose down your tomato plant at night, that wet, uh, that moisture will keep frost from, from happening. So, any type of protection you can give a plant on a frost night is worth it. Even if if you have to run out there and put something over it, um, one of the best things people do for backyard growers put them in pots. And you know, it's never good to grow a tomato indoors because it doesn't have enough light. But it's easy to bring it inside at eight o'clock at night and put it out in the next morning at eight o'clock in the morning. Just to protect it from the frost, so having a plant that's plant that's portable is really beneficial. So the answer to your question is, yeah, your screen porch is probably enough because there's plenty of heat probably uh, bouncing off of your house to keep the air around that plant at or above 32 degrees. So I would say that you wouldn't ha shouldn't have any problem putting it on a screen porch. Uh, for a permanent solution, all you got to do is make sure you need to have enough light. Tomatoes need lots of light. Uh, the plant can thrive in moderate light, but the fruit will not <coughs> ripen without light. Okay. Uh, one other thing from that user here. If you can clarify which recipe Pepper was talking about, because the comments are actually delayed from the talking. Uh, by the time I got this comment, he was... Pie. Okay. I posted so, the one for tomato pie. I just posted a Paula Dean tomato pie on Homestead Help on Facebook. That's maybe where I got it from. Is that where you got it from? My wife printed it off of Food Network, so it probably was. Okay. Yes, it was Food Network. Mm -hmm. Now, the tomato uh, jam recipe, I just Googled tomato jam and, and 
made the first one that I found. Um, I wouldn't recommend. If you find one with lots of sugar and nutmeg, tomatoes and nutmeg, you know, you wouldn't think they would go together, and they really don't. So I wouldn't recommend that one to anybody. But if you can find a way to make tomato into jam, it's a great way to, to preserve your leftovers. Now, what I had was not only do I have tomatoes left over, but I have a lot of tomatoes that don't look spectacular, and no one's going to buy them. They might have a, a, one bug bite on it, but people aren't going to buy that one. There's nothing wrong with it. So I have I have a lot of leftovers in there. Tomato jam is a good something to experiment with. Um, we're probably not going to experiment with it anymore, but uh, if you're Margie and you cook all the time, maybe it's a good way to experiment with leftover tomatoes. Now, Pepper, um, oh, go ahead, Margie. Oh, leftover tomatoes. To me, anything, any type of produce that, um, if it has a bite in it, I just say that the bug has good taste. I mean, you know, they like the <laughs> same type of thing that we like. Uh, cut it out. I mean, as long as it hasn't cr created any problems around it, just cut the the bite out of it. Now, I know as far as selling at a produce market, people tend to want to buy the really nice looking produce unless the person that's selling it is selling it at a discount, which is what I would uh, prefer to do. This is you go go to the market, you stop by the market, you're wanting fresh produce today, then you just ask, will you have some that are the discounted, maybe have some you know, bad places on it or whatever, you just cut it out and you eat it that same day. Um, of course, if you're going to be canning, the the bites and all of that, you just cut them out because you're going to be cutting it all up anyway to be cooking it down and getting it prepared to be canned. So um, that I would just put all of that over to the side for canning. So And, and of course, if you do compost, then it's always useful for compost if you're not going to use it to eat. Or I guess if you have animals that we haven't gotten our cow to eat the tomatoes yet, but we don't have goats like other people do. Chickens. Do goats eat tomatoes I mean, it's, chicken. mm -hmm. Now, Pepper, we're talking about all the different things we can do with these tomatoes and whether we want to harvest them over time or all at once, but are there also different varieties we want to choose from? If we know we're going to make a jam or we know we're going to make a pie, do we want to be selective in the actual variety as well? Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, if you, Most any catalog that you order, especially the, the big ones, uh, Johnny Seed, uh, Burpee, will, will have their tomatoes and they're broken down by type. You've got your, your globe tomatoes, you've got Roma tomatoes, which are oblong, globe tomatoes, um, slicing tomatoes, the tomato that you think of. And then you've got paste tomatoes. Now those, the difference there is the, the skin's a little softer. The flesh is a lot softer. You know, a, a paste tomato, when it's ripe, you're going to think, well, it's maybe overripe as compared to a regular size tomato. But those are specifically designed to make paste out of. Uh, Big Mama is one of the best. It's about the size of uh, like a, a small Nerf football. And it makes, it, it's, it is just designed to stick in a crock pot and melt down into uh, spaghetti sauce. So... Uh, different varieties are, are made for different types. The best ones we have found from like Burpee um, are, um, well, we like the yellow tomatoes, and apparently, given my sales, no one else in the area likes yellow tomatoes. I love yellow tomatoes. There's one called Sweet Tangerine. It's just our favorite. And the best thing we have found with it is cut it out and fill it with tuna fish because it's it's a sweeter tomato. doesn't have the bite. Now, my mom, bless her, her favorite was the old variety called Marion, and it's one of those, you take a bite out of it, and your entire face just puckers up, and you can't talk for 20 minutes. It's got so much acid in it. Everyone has their own opinion about how tomatoes should taste, but um, Sweet Tangerine was our favorite ever from Burpee because it had so many uses, and it was a great one to introduce the kids to, we thought. Great one to introduce the kids to because it was sweeter. Um, now, as far as the heirlooms are concerned, I've been trying to grow the heirlooms, and everyone has their own favorite heirloom. The, um, Virginia Sweets is one. Mr. Stripe is one, the one that's orange and, and red striped together. Um, Brandywine is the one that everyone thinks about. And Cherokee Purple. Now, Cherokee Purple, all the folks in my area say, oh, it's just wonderful. It just, it's just the most, it's a great tasting tomato, but it's purple. Now, I'm an LSU fan. I love purple, but not necessarily in my tomatoes. Because you cut it open, it looks like it's been rotten for about five years. <laughs> I, nothing wrong with it. It tastes great, but it's a dark tomato, and... I'm used to my tomatoes not being that color. But uh, Cherokee Purple is a very, very wonderful tasting tomato. The only problem with any of the heirlooms, but the joke around here is uh, when someone gets a cold in Oklahoma, 
uh, the tomatoes catch it here in Mississippi because arrowed tomatoes just catch diseases like you wouldn't believe. Like they're in a, like it's a kid in a, in a daycare center. Okay. Let's see here. We, now we do have some questions that were uh, stockpiled here while we were waiting between episodes, and one of them actually comes from the first uh, the first episode that we have. And uh, Tommy, we're gonna have to rely. Or, uh, sorry, Tommy. Uh, I mean Pepper. We're gonna have to rely on. Uh, <laughs> have to rely on your experience on this again because uh, Tommy wasn't sure about this one on the first episode. And the question was, have you ever heard of using agricultural gypsum when planting tomatoes? And I haven't. Uh, Pepper, are you familiar with that product at all? I mean, gypsum is is you know your your wall board, the sheetrock out of gypsum. Gypsum is another form of lime. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, most people don't have access to it. Most people who would have access to it wouldn't buy it because it comes, you know, by the ton, by the acre. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it. Any form of lime, it, you know, as long as you get your soil test, make sure you need lime because uh, tomatoes like a pH range of 5.5 to 6.5. Too much lime, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be pushing the pH up into the sevens and eights, and you're not gonna be able to grow a tomato anyway. So there's nothing wrong with using gypsum if you need lime or need anything to. Um, to raise the pH of your, of your soil. So I wouldn't have a problem if I had access to it. Okay. Uh, another question we've got pending here, uh, coming off of the uh, Google Plus page, actually got asked on YouTube as well. Can you clone one or the other type better for multiple plants? I imagine we're talking about determinate versus indeterminate. They both will, will, um, will do the same. Now, Taking suckers of your tomato plant is one of the best ways to, if you have a particular, and I'll explain suckers in just a second. If you have a particular plant, you know, you say you have one pack of the seeds, you got 25 seeds in there, you plant all 25. Some of those are going to be better than others. Find your best one and then take suckers of it. Now, what, what's a sucker? You got your main stalk of a tomato plant and you got your side stalk. And in between there, you're going to see little, little uh, leaves coming out. It's called a sucker. You let it get about three or four inches long, you snap it off or you cut it off. And you stick it in water. One of the wonderful things about a tomato plant, they will form roots anywhere along the stem that it contacts any, any moisture. So find the best plant that you have, the healthiest looking plant that you have, snap the suckers off, and then put it in water, and that's going to grow a brand new plant. Take that plant, grow it, take suckers off it. You can keep the same, the one individual same plant going for years and years and years just by taking uh, cuttings off of it and, and rooting them. You know, if you have, if you live in a in a wetter area like mine, I have before taken, you know, thirty or forty suckers, snapped them off, stuck them in the ground next to the plant. About half of them are going to die, but the half of them, without any extra effort on my part, are going to go ahead and root and turn into plants. So tomatoes are the one of the world's easiest plants to clone, to to do, um, take cuttings from, and and make better plants. Now, I haven't seen any difference in uh, determinate versus indeterminate when kind of comes to make a, uh, take a sucker off of it. Uh, some plants are, the, the heirloom varieties themselves are, the skin's tougher, the plant is weaker, so all things being equal, the, the healthier the plant is, the uh, better of a clone you're going to get from it. So, you know, typically if, if a Home Depot sells it, it's because everyone in the country can grow it. So those are going to make your best, your best suckers, your best, your best uh, clones, essentially. Oh, Jared, your mute's on. Appreciate that. No problem. So, explain this to me. I've got a Granny Smith apple tree, and I had to go buy rootstock for that because you can't just take a Granny Smith apple and take seed out of it and grow an, a true-to-name Granny Smith apple tree for right. seed. Is is that true with some tomatoes, all tomatoes? And the reason I'm going here is because you're talking about using suckers, and I had the thought come through my head of, well, why doesn't he just save the seed? And I thought, well, maybe the same thing happens with tomatoes. Maybe you have to do that in order to get a true variety. What do you know? Yeah, most most tomato plants that you buy are um, are hybrids, and that means that when you plant the seed from it, it's not going to be the same as a plant that you bought the seed. Same as the seeds that you bought. Now you can get what's called open pollinated tomatoes, uh, heirloom tomatoes. Although the word heirloom itself 
uh, in the National Registry means it's been in circulation for a certain period of time. So there are now some hybrid tomatoes that fall under the category of heirloom. But anyway, open pollinated. When you go to Burpee Catalog or anything like that, this is OP next to it. It's open pollinated. The seeds from that are going to grow the same exact plant the next time around. Uh, Brandywine red and Cherokee purple, those seeds, you save them, you plant them the next year, you get the exact same plant. Better boy um, or early girl from, from Burpee, you plant those the next year, it's going to be similar, but it's not going to be the exact same plant. It won't have the exact same traits. You know, if, if, it's been, if the plant has been bred for early or it's been bled to be, bred to be resistant to certain uh, diseases, the offspring, the seed from that, may not have that, that same disease resistance, may not have that same earliness factor. So for those, the best thing to do is take cuttings. Even if you're not planning on, you know, taking a cutting on the plant right before the frost comes in November, or whenever frost comes in your neck of the wood, and put it in, in water just to keep the plant going until next March. You may have to grow that plant, take a cutting for the original way, grow another one, in order to keep the plant going up until March. Um, but that's the only way that you can, if you have a plant that's just perfect and you want a copy of it, the only way to guarantee a copy of it is take a cutting off of it because you, you never know if the seed's going to be uh, the same or not. Sadly, these days, even when it's labeled hybrid or non-hybrid, I don't know if we can trust that it's, well, that's a whole other topic of discussion is whether we can trust uh, agricultural companies or not. We won't go into that. I agree with you. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> All right, let's see here. We did have one other question, and I believe, uh, Pepper, you were able to help this lady on our on our Facebook page. And uh, while I'm on that, let me see if I can well, I'll get to that in a second. I apologize. The question was uh, that there was a lady who had a small tomato plant that was already blooming, and she wanted to know if she should pull the blooms off the plant so that it would grow bigger, or should she leave it alone? Yeah, I mean, any plant that uh, – any fruiting – plant that you put in the ground. Um, as the vegetables that we plant come in two varieties. You've got the kind that we eat the whole plant, like celery or lettuce, and you have kind that put out fruit, like tomatoes and peppers. Uh, any fruiting plant has two different distinct stages of growth. It's got vegetative growth and fruiting growth. Uh, typically speaking, you want the plant to be as stocky and as healthy during the vegetative growth period before it blooms because then it's putting all of its energy into reproducing itself and sustaining itself. Now, if your plant is really short and stubby, you know, it, it may, it, and, you, and you leave the flowers on, uh, it's going to start producing um, fruit, and it's going to draw energy from the growth process that it would have normally been going through. But, the tomato takes a long time to form, and those, those um, fruit take a long time to grow. So, I wouldn't pull them off because, you know, the, the plant knows what it's doing. I mean, at the end of the day, the plant does know what it's doing. Um, God designed them that way. So I would I would leave them on because all things being equal, if there's a problem, any, anytime a plant faces any stress in the world, its first reaction is to abort whatever blooms or fruit it has on and switch back into vegetative growth. In fact, one of the great ways that I have found with lettuces because uh, one of the challenges in growing lettuce in the south is the heat. Heat makes lettuce bolt. I don't know if you know what bolting is on a plant, but it sends up a giant thick bolt of flowers. Uh, cilantro does that. It goes from the... Anyway, you take the, the lettuce plant and you slightly pull it up out of the ground to break some of those roots. It stresses the plant and it switches. It turns off the switch of reproductive growth and goes back into vegetative growth. That's the way you can keep a lettuce from bolting. Well, it's made it the same way. If those blooms are too early and that plant starts to go through a stress, it's going to abort the flowers anyway without harming itself at all. So I'd like to leave plants alone um, as much as I can. If they start to set fruit, I'll let them set their fruit because, you know, it tends to know what it's doing. Pepper. Yeah. Oh, what about, um, I hear myself back. Um, what about the shaking your tomato plants? Have you mentioned that at all? You. Um, well, the tomato is a, um, it's pollinated by, by the wind. Uh, it pollinates itself. The self-pollinating, uh, you don't have to, unlike corn or other plants, you don't have to have a bee carry pollen from one plant to another plant to pollinate it. The pollen that the, 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 
the stamen or pistol, the stamen puts out on the flower can fall directly back into the flower and um, and pollinate. So most tomatoes are pollinated by wind. The wind blows, the pollen puffs off and drops a quarter of an inch and pollinates that flower. So if you're indoors, for whatever reason, if you have it growing inside or have it growing in a greenhouse, you're going to have to agitate that flower somehow to get the pollen to, 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 to move. So um, most uh, greenhouse growers have a little vibrating wand. Most home growers will use a uh, electric toothbrush and you touch the uh, the base of the flower and it causes it, it shakes the flower enough to pollinate. You can buy bumblebees. I use a leaf blower. Um, I just blow down the road because I'm lazy like that. But uh, if you have problems <laughs> with your with your fruit, your fruit looks funny if it's not quite round. If it the insides are not like they should be, it's poor pollination. And um, if you live in an area with, without a lot of wind. Or if your plants are planted up against a house, it's a windbreak. Or if your plants are, uh, for whatever reason, if your plants aren't getting enough wind to pollinate them, then you might need to. All you have to do is walk along and take two seconds to shake the entire plant, and that's going to do it. If it's a really dry day, you can see a tiny little puff of yellow off the flowers. That right there is pollinated your, pollinated your flower. Typically, a tomato flower needs two or three days of pollination to make the tomato the way it needs to be. Okay. All right. There's a question here for you, Tommy. Or, God, why do I keep doing that, Pepper? Um, I'm going to LSU cap on and put gray yeah, on my it's, beard. It's too much, too much purple. I get confused. <laughs> uh, do you have a way to keep tomatoes growing in the heat of the summer? And while you're answering this, if you could maybe explain the difference between your high tunnel and a greenhouse, because I think maybe there might be something worth pointing out there. Oh, uh, well, to answer the second question first, from the outside, Everyone looks at my high tunnel and says, oh, it's a greenhouse, because it's a giant plastic and metal structure, which is like a greenhouse. The difference is what's on the inside. A greenhouse is where it's completely climate controlled. Most greenhouses have a concrete floor. The plants are grown either in pots or in a soil-less material, uh, irrigated, and they have uh, heating and cooling systems. Um, a high tunnel is basically a giant cold frame. Everyone knows what a cold frame is. You know, you've seen those little boxes that are about a foot off the ground with glass on top. That's all a high tunnel is. Is the reason uh, the purpose of a high tunnel is for season extension. It gives you about three or four extra weeks in the beginning of the season and the end of the season um, because there's no heat in there. It's basically a giant plastic lid put on the ground. All of my plants are grown in the ground. Um, now I try to stretch the limits of anything. I'm a man, you know. If I can, if, if, if a little bit is good, then ten times much more than that is, is even better. So. I try to make my tomatoes grow uh, as much as I possibly can in the winter time. Um, so that's the difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is high tunnels doesn't really have to have heat or electricity. In fact, if you get yours like I did from the NRCS program, Natural Resources Conservation Service, if the government pays for yours, I can get mine, um, you're not allowed to have uh, heat in there. First question, in the summertime, tomatoes uh, won't set their fruit. Um, a tomato plant optimum growing temperature is 65 to 85. It'll do fine at 90. But once you hit 95 degrees, that flower is going to sit there until the temperature is not 95 degrees anymore. Um, matter of fact, if it's got fruit on it, it's going to start popping that fruit off. Have you ever seen your tomato flowers laying on the ground in, in, in August? It's just too hot. The only way to avoid that is to either cool the plant down, which is almost impossible, or get uh, a heat uh, tolerant variety. Now, what I would do is I buy... Uh, several varieties. There's one called Heat Wave 2. Um, the most popular variety that I have found, it's a really good variety, is called Florida 91. Um, I know that um, most of the major seed companies have that. The other one I use is um, called Bella Rosa. Uh, -E -L -L -A -R -O -S -A, B-E-L-L-A-R-O-S-A. Bella Rosa. And those are recommended for the deep south. For They will set fruit at a higher temperature than your better boys and big boys and, and early girls. Now, if it's 100 degrees, nothing's going to work. But Bella Rosa and um, Heat Wave and Florida 91 will set fruit longer than the other ones will. So that's the only way you can do it is to plan ahead for it. Uh, you can't. You can't. There's really no way. Once you once the heat hits and your plant is stressed, you just got to sit back and wait until the heat cools off because there's no way to correct it unless you want to put it in the air conditioning. Give us those names again. Um, Bella Rosa. Florida 91 are the two that I have used myself. 
that, that I have proven that are, that are good provider. Matter of fact, last year when I abandoned my greenhouse for personal reasons, I had too much going on, I came out there and, and um, Florida 91 had grown, the fruit had rotted, and it had reseeded, and it had grown up again all in the, in the heat of the greenhouse, because my greenhouse is 110 degrees in the summertime um, by itself. So Florida 91, I would highly recommend for anybody who wants one of those, I'm going to plant it, go on vacation for five months, and come back and have a plant. He apparently will do that. So Bella Rosa, Florida 91, Heat Wave, and one more of it I remember is called Sun Guard. Those four, I have either personal or uh, anecdotal evidence, those will set and produce tomatoes more in the summertime than others. Again, everything is relative. Is there a plane flying over you right now, Jared? Maybe it's, a, it's one of those black helicopters that are coming, right? I mentioned the word government. I should have done that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you know, when you think you're on mute, you're, you're not. When you start talking, you are. It's all those kind of fun things. So. Do you grow tomatoes, by the way, Jared? Uh, I have attempted, sir. Uh, I I put in attempted. a is it is it beef steak? Is that the heirloom, the popular yes. heirloom that uh, MHP uh, gardener Bobby does? Uh, I lay down an entire row of those and have one that is starting to um, have blooms on it. And there are a couple more that have started to come up down the line, but uh, far from anything that you would ever see on Bobby's channel or, or yours or probably anybody else's because I'm silly enough to actually put it on YouTube that it's not doing well. But, you know, I think, number one, I put it in the ground too early. Uh, we had a couple other cold nights, and uh, I had a lot more seedlings at one point, and then all of a sudden I was down to just three or four plants on them what's well, about a, I don't know, 12 foot long row. So, um, but I'm hopeful for the one because I mean, my whole garden this year is just an experiment and to say, okay, well this seemed to work. This didn't, maybe this is helping the soil. Maybe that's not. And then next year is when we'll go hog wild and I'll start having a garden that looks a little more like, um, I like Rob Bob down there in Australia and, and I'll still not know what plants actually are. I'll just know I have a lot of them hopefully. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but no, the, uh, you know, it's one of those interesting things. My wife and, and Pepper don't take this out on her. If you guys ever get to meet, she is not a tomato fan. Uh, but so, she's, you know, LSU fan, right? So that's okay. I'm sorry. Say that again. She's, she's an LSU fan. So that's okay. Right. Uh, we'll say yes just to satisfy you, sir. <laughs> and, uh, she, uh, she's never been a big tomato fan, so uh, she'll eat all the tomato products, but you know she won't slice one up and put it on a burger or put it in a mater sandwich or anything like that. So it's uh, it's one of those things that we've never focused on, but uh, we're going to start doing that and live and learn our way through it, if you will. How about and, you, Margaret? Do you grow them? Um, uh, this is my first year growing tomatoes. And I do have some pictures on my um, personal profile, of, if anybody would like to see those. But right now, um, it seems like the ones that are doing the best were the ones that ended up in a pot that I didn't realize were there. <laughs> it's like, as I was scattering, the, I guess maybe the wind just went away and it ended up in a another pot and it's growing big and strong and... The same is the case with my raised bed. I have, um, I guess, about 12 in my raised bed, and then um, I guess six, eight or so that I have planted in the ground, and then two, um, maybe two or more actually in a container. I have some that uh, I did this. I did all of these from seeds. Um, I did. Some that are still, they need to be transplanted, and I was going to use this, and I guess I, if it's time, I can segue into some creative containers um, to actually begin to use those because I'm running out of my space in my actual raised beds. I don't want to, you know, choke them out. Um, one thing I did want to ask you before we get off of this too much I have my cucumbers planted next to my tomatoes, and the cucumber leaves are kind of covering some of those tomatoes. What do I need to do about that? Do Is that okay, or is that going to get in the way? It depends on the time of 
year. Um, in the in the, the heat of the summer, a tomato can actually get sun scald. If you ever notice a tomato and it's got uh, yellow or white on it, it's, it's been sun scald. So in the, the heat of the summer, having some shade is good. But while the, the tomato plant is actually, while the fruit is green, you want to give it as much sunlight as possible. Okay. Now, so I would I would try. As a matter of fact, you, a lot of people trim their own tomato plants because sometimes the plant itself has too many leaves for the fruit. So if you got something that's big leaves like a cucumber next to it, you might want to give them some space or trim them back. Okay. You know, companion planting with tomatoes is a good idea. Um, there's a lot of things you can plant with tomatoes that will actually help out with the bugs. We planted um, we planted basil. Off, I think we don't want people in Mississippi to call it basil. Basil. I'm sorry. We planted basil. Uh, next two hours one time, and it kept the, the bugs at bay more so than the ones we didn't plant them. So a lot of time, there's a lot of plants you can put together. Now, tomatoes and cucumbers both need lots of space. Um, do you let your tomato, your cucumbers vine up behind it? Yes, this, this one is vining up, and I have a fence, um, a section of fence that I put in there. It's vining up the fence. So it's, oh, it's off of my tomatoes. Uh, initially, the cucumber was basically taking over my tomatoes so I knew I wasn't going to be able to leave them like that. Um, the actual tentacles they just like wrap around the plant so um, I got it up on a trellis, fence trellis now and it's staying off tomatoes. Well, that's good. Now, what's this about creative containers? Okay creative containers um, this is a as uh, Jared was saying for him this is his first uh, attempt or uh, maybe that's not the right he just said it was uh, a test. This year is like an experiment for my husband and I because this is the first time we've ever grown a garden. Now my parents have been garden growers so I've been around it but I have always been accustomed to you get out the tiller, you till, 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 you have these rows and you know, have all of these plants come up. And so I never attempted to grow a garden because of that. Uh, I felt like, well, you had to have this large space in order to be able to actually grow something. And and as we've learned more um, about gardening and backyard gardening, urban gardening, we're finding that that is not the case. And so I went out and look for some creative containers of how you can do this at home, keep it low budget, you don't have to buy everything from a store. There are a lot of things that, that we have that we can recycle that, it, that you use every day in your home that you are putting in a recycle bin maybe or if you're in an area like we're in we don't have a recycle program like that. So it just ends up in the trash and in a landfill somewhere not being useful. One example of that would be like a milk container or a two liter bottle. Anything that has a, a nice size opening that you can cut off the bottom portion of and flip over. And you've seen these topsy turvy growers. And you put your plant while it's still small. You drop your plant in upside down through that hole. Of course, you want to have your a good root system there and not to harm it and fill it in with its soil. What I thought was really interesting, I have some links that I don't know if they're showing up. Maybe some of you who are commenting, tell me if you see my links that I had there. I have the creative container on Pinterest. Um, it's my Pinterest page that you'll be able to find them on. But... Um, you can actually plant these, you're talking about basil, being able to plant that along with it. The, those are uh, companion plants. Those that are companions to the tomato, you can plant right on top of it. Herbs, that is, that's not going to like completely overtake your plant. So that would just be one tomato plant, but like you were, you were talking about, if it's, you would need to have a way, you drill a hole on each side and have a way to hang it up but there it doesn't require any digging in your ground so if you're a renter and you can't do that type of thing you just need to have a place where you can hang these items and then whenever uh, you uh, have gotten all of the plants off of them that you want then you toss your 
um, plastic container and then next year when it's time to plant again you surely will be using the same products that you can use these different ones for and again it has Jared tell me is there a link were you able to get the link I was able to uh, get it where I could try to share them but the uh, little comment tracker thing here was cutting the links off they were too long so okay what I did here is uh, this is a link everybody to our uh, Facebook page for Homestead Help and I know it doesn't say Facebook but I had to use a little shortener uh, to make the URL fit on the okay. screen here so anybody that can write down that and and of course guys when uh, when I can get into YouTube and add this into the description on YouTube I will add all these links there as well you can also find the links on the uh, Google Plus event uh, or you can go to the Facebook page so we're trying to keep you well covered but uh, go ahead Monday. So um, something that I see here too is a do-it-yourself um, earth box and it's the, the plastic containers like storage containers that you can get. Um, this is on Pinterest also. Uh, that's really a great place to go to be able to look for the do-it-yourself type planting. But they, they do the lasagna type layering where you put in some of your compost and it gives you step by step how to do this with the storage container. Um, you use uh, all of this, put your soil in, and then you put your plants directly into it. it. It's actually covered with what looks like some type of moisture barrier on top of it to keep the moisture within. And there's a way, a system there, how it, it maintains um, water. So that's another uh, example of a create a container. Of course, the same with any type of regular potted plant, like a hanging potted plant, you can drill, do the hole. It needs to be large enough for your plant to drop through, but you can do that. Now, if the problem with a potted plant and planting a tomato is tomato is going to grow too tall for it, for you to be able to support it. So if you turn it upside down, gravity helps you with that, and it remains straight instead of trying to become deformed and, and grow over the sides of the potted plant. That's a good um, time to use the determiner, by the way. Okay. Um, the bush, bush tomatoes, because one of the things that, um, with the, just when you buy a tomato in the description, it'll tell you all about it. The bush type will tell you how big it's going to grow, a 36-inch, 48-inch. And if you go to something like Burpee, like I mentioned, they will typically have the word bush next to, like, they've got early girl and bush early girl, better boy, bush better boy. And they'll have, have a description, 36 inches. So, if you've got a patio and you want to do this, uh, the, the hanging method or even the container method, you can find plants that are tailor-made to the height that you are looking for so that it won't grow all over creation. So basically anything that will hold soil will you can grow in. You just need to be sure that you've drilled holes in it to be able to um, provide some drainage. I saw even some cute ideas that a old pair of overalls that someone had planted some plants in and that was a really cute idea but what you have to remember with that is that it is fabric will rot and it will rot quickly whenever you put uh, soil and you have all the bugs and all that are going to be growing in um, or will be inside that soil so you have to be sure that, that you use some type of um, of the gardening fabric to go inside it um, if you wanted to have some kind of type of a cute thing like that. Um, but I see a question here. You want to go ahead with the question? Yeah, our time's kind of creeping up on us okay. here, guys. So um, the question is, when do you start fall planting for zone 9B? Now I'm not familiar with where everywhere that 9B is, but I'm guessing... 9B is, is South Texas Florida. and Orlando. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know they had fall down there. Goodness, uh, but you know, I would October. You tomato takes seventy days from the time you put it in the ground to the time you get about seventy days. The time you get a, a plant, you did, it takes about six weeks from seed to transplant. So you're looking at uh, what's that? Six that's the forty-two days. So about a hundred days from the time you plant the seed to the time you get uh, fruit. So that's a rule of thumb: three months back up from whenever you think the frost is going to kill it. And that's when you put in uh, a fall garden for tomatoes. 
you know, I'm a real proponent of the National Weather Service, mainly because our taxes pay for that and not the Weather Channel. And you can actually find a lot of information on the National Weather Service, such as if you're not familiar with your average frost date, uh, your first or last frost date, you can find that kind of information on National Weather Service. Yeah. So I'll look up some information for that and um, put it on our Facebook page uh, after the show's done, too. So I need, uh, uh, I, need, I need two minutes for a rant, if you don't mind. Okay. See you um, in a minute. No, no, no. no for a rant. <laughs> That's the bathroom break. Um. About store-bought tomatoes. Yeah, I want to rant about store-bought tomatoes. And people are always complaining. You know, people thought that I was growing hothouse tomatoes, uh, uh, hydroponic tomatoes. Although, if you look at MHP Gardener, his hydroponic tomatoes are wonderful looking. Um, here's what a store-bought tomato is: they take a green tomato and they put uh, gas to it, and that turns it not, not gasoline. They put um, I've got argon on the brain. It's not argon. It'll come to me in ethylene, ethylene gas. Um, same thing that's produced by any ripening fruit puts out ethylene gas. They take a green tomato, they harvest it, they gas it with ethylene, and it turns it red. It doesn't ripen it, it turns it red. Why do they do this? So they can ship it cross country. Have you ever taken a tomato out of your back garden that was ready to eat that day and squeezed it? It's not going to survive the trip to your car, much less the trip to California. Right. So when you buy it, no matter if it's organic, no matter how it was grown, you go to the grocery store, and just by very definition of it having been shipped to your grocery store, that tomato is not going to taste like anything because it's the ripening process that turns, that makes, you wouldn't think of an acid tomato as having sugar, but it turns those, those uh, starches into sugars. In fact, you take a tomato that's wonderful, you stick it in the refrigerator, and those sugars turn back into starch, and it turns tasteless again. But every tomato that you've got in the grocery store that's, that's shipped in is picked green and then turned red. Again, it's not ripened at all. It's turned red by ethylene gas. As a matter of fact, here's an experiment. Take a green tomato, stick it in a paper sack with a banana. Two days later, you'll have a store-bought tomato. It tastes like nothing, but it's red, and it's beautiful, and it's hard as all get out, and it will survive being put in a, on the back of a truck over 25,000 miles. So when people compare mine, to, you know, mine don't look like store-bought. Mine, mine don't taste like store-bought either. There's no way in the world that you could you can ship good ripened tomatoes. It just won't happen. I would encourage anybody to go out on YouTube and look for, type in the words, Jimmy Doherty. Uh, he's a he's a farmer from, from Britain. Uh, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y. Um, look up his global harvesting. He's got a, he goes and visits a tomato farm in California. They have a giant machine that harvests all the tomatoes at one time, and there's this um, chain conveyor belt that takes it from the ground up to his hopper, and the chain actually rips all the leaves off the plant. They don't pick the fruit. They chop the plants down. And as it's going up the, the, this chain, the chain is ripping the leaves and the stalks off. And by the time it gets to the top, all that's left is the fruit. My thing is, if the fruit can survive the trip up a chain when the leaves can't, that fruit can't be worth anything. So anyway, you go to the grocery store, no matter what the tomato looks like, it is a green tomato. They're all green tomatoes that have been turned red. So thus ends my rant. So buy okay. local. <laughs> buy local. Right, that's the best advice we could probably give is buy local. Now, look, um, I don't want to forget this before we get short on time, so I do want to mention uh, in our first episode, Pepper was unable to join us uh, due to some technical things, and now today Tommy is unable to join us due to some professional obligations, so he does want us to know, go Tigers. Um, <laughs> and I just I wouldn't feel right if I didn't share that with you guys. So. That's right. Tommy, be safe out there. Drive safe, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Um, but one last thing I want to cover is we, we've kind of gone almost the full spectrum here, guys. We've talked about uh, the planting all the way to harvesting and, and eating them. But now how do we reconnect those uh, the ends of that circle together? So, uh, Pepper, Margie, either one of you, are you going to look to save any of your seeds? Are you going to look to do the saplings, or is it easier for you to just uh, start over with uh, some new purchased seed uh, in the next season? I would love, if, if my tomatoes turned out really well for me, I would love to continue using my seeds because I would know what to expect the next season. I just don't know much about saving seeds. Pepper, what can you tell us about that? Again, you can only save seed um, confidently from open pollinators. If you're growing um, 
brandywine red or if you're growing Cherokee purple, by all means, save the seed. It'll save you some money. So for me, tomato seed doesn't cost that much, and it's easier for me to store little packets of seed over the winter than it is to, odd enough, I have all the space in the world, but it's uh, storing all those seedlings. Um, I typically always buy seed, mainly because it gives me an excuse to read my tomato seed catalog. There's a company out there called Tomato Growers Supply, and their website is tomatogrowers.com, and it is basically, forgive me, it is tomato porn. There are about 200 different varieties of tomatoes, and I I read this thing in bed at night. It is just, it's amazing. All the, So I buy seed, I buy my tomatoes as seed instead of as plants. I don't keep plants just because I like to be able to buy new seed next year. My, my new favorite seed, my new favorite tomato plant in the world is called Stupice, um, S-T-U-P-I-C-E. It's a, it's a cold tolerant. It was bred in Czechoslovakia back when there actually was a Czechoslovakia. Um, and it loves the cold and hates the heat. So basically, Mississippi, it can't stand. But I try to make it grow here anyway. But I found it under tomatogrowers.com. So I would recommend folks, if they if they are in need of an extra 200 varieties of tomatoes, go check that out. Um, so to answer your question, I don't graft and I don't keep plants over the wintertime just because it's I've got all the setup for growing and stuff. It's too easy for me to grow from seed. So I, I just buy seed because it gives me an excuse to, to buy seed. Okay. Well, I can tell you one thing is I love on our community here on YouTube, I love when people do experiments and they try to prove or disprove a old wives tale or line of thought or whatever the case may be. And I don't know if that's really what he was trying to do, but uh, on the topic of saving seeds and specifically tomatoes, uh, Rob Bob uh, had one here recently where he took tomatoes and he took the seeds right out of the tomato and put them right into soil. He took some that had been um, basically sun dried and then some others where I guess there's a process through fermentation that you get that, uh, I believe he was just calling it a gel sack. I don't know what the yeah. scientific uh, determination on it is mm -hmm. that surrounds the seed. The fermentation process strips that away and you're left with just a, a dry seed like what you'd buy at the store. And uh, interestingly, he had 100% germination. Uh, he did find that the seeds that had gone through the fermentation process uh, sprouted quicker and were looking healthier than the other ones, but all of them produced plants. So apparently, uh, you know, uh, Pepper, you were kind of talking about this earlier, and, and I've always liked this uh, kind of phrase here, but the plant wants to grow. All yeah. we've got to do is kind of get out of the way. <laughs> and when you have that, like you mentioned, the fermentation process, you know, like I said, I, I had my Florida 91, my heat tolerance, that basically the, the, the fruit grew, it dropped off, it rotted on the ground and sprouted. And what you're getting there, the tomato rots, it produces nitrogen, and that nitrogen is a little boost for the, for the new seedling. That's why uh, the plants that are grown from that way are going to be taller, faster than other ones because they've got some basically ready-made compost surrounding them. But uh, yeah, I, I love to, uh, to see nature uh, thwart mankind. So and this will be... Right. Never mind. This will be the last uh, thing we go over because it's kind of on topic. Uh, this user posted a, a video uh, just a little while ago that showed a plant that uh, basically bounced right back. Uh, Pepper, is that something that you have seen before? Have you ever had a, a tomato plant look like it just saw its last day and then all of a sudden it was resurrected? And Yeah. I, I yeah. Mean, it kind of just goes one back of, to it wants to live. One of the benefits of a tomato, like I said, not only will it um, – Will it put out roots anywhere that the stem touches moisture, but the stem itself will, um, will I hate to use this phrase, will do photosynthesis. The stem itself has the ability to photosynthesize. So if you lose all that leaf surface area, it's not great, but the stem can still continue on the process of photosynthesis for the plant. So, you know, if, if it can survive, it's going to find a way to survive. Now, certain varieties are hardier. I suspect that that was a, a hybrid and not an heirloom. An heirloom, I've, I've coddled them before. And they just committed suicide one day. And so, but, look, but the hybrids tend to be pretty hardy. Okay. All right, guys. Well, we have hit our hour mark. So we're just going to go around one time here, give anybody a uh, last chance to get some final thoughts off their minds and share anything with you before we close out. So, uh, Margie, we'll start with you. Got anything else for the group? I would just say that whenever those tomatoes come out, if you don't live in the South and you have never tried a tomato sandwich or a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, then you have not lived. So be sure that you use them whenever you can. Don't trash the ones that have a little bite in it. Just cut it out. 
because they can be, they're still good. They're not going to be bad. And I would just say, um, it's probably hard to tell. I'm not passionate about it at all, but don't buy tomatoes from the store. Store-bought tomatoes are not tomatoes. They're something else entirely. So don't, they're masquerading as tomatoes. I'm going to calm down now. Buy local. <laughs> Find somebody that has ripened tomatoes out of their backyard and eat those things. The ones you get from the store, the ones that come on your hamburger from Wendy's, are not tomatoes. I'm done. <laughs> And if they're purple, it's okay. Some kooky guy from yes. LSU grew them. It's okay. They're purple, they're okay. They're okay. <laughs> they're even better. Okay, guys. Uh, well, just for everybody's sake, uh, we've been really excited to have everybody here today. We've noticed there's been about 10 viewers online uh, watching with us, so thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. If you've got any other questions or comments that we didn't cover during the show, please either uh, leave them here on the YouTube or on Google Plus or join us on the Facebook page. Whatever suits your fancy the best, we'll be sure to find you. And you can find us next month on July 2nd. That's the first Tuesday in the month. We're just going to keep that schedule. And next month we are going to talk about critters. We're going to talk about all the different animals that we have or want on our homesteads and the different benefits from them. So any questions that you have about critters, Leave those as well, and we'll get ourselves primed up to answer your questions ahead of time. So uh, one last uh, thank you uh, to everybody for, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks.